Amen. I was part of a retreat one time, and, um, you know, you go to these seminars, and you don't expect silence to play such a big role in the seminars because you're looking forward to hearing something. You're looking forward to experiencing something. You're looking forward to being lifted up. And so many times we equate as Westerners success as how loud it was or how how bright it was or how amazing the experience was but this retreat particularly blocked off large hours of time where they were silent hours we were doing work in silence and how comfortable are we as a culture and you know most people have the earbuds in and there's always some type of noise that's present to occupy and keep our minds on some type of a loop away from slowing down enough to where we can almost hear ourselves breathe. We can hear every creak in the floor. We can hear every challenge or, or whatever, every sound. And if, you, if you're in your house and you're quiet and you're by yourself, you get to know the sounds of your house. Who knows that's true? You start to hear creaks and when you're young, you think that's ghosts and all these goblins and, and it's scary but silence is such an important part of our of our practice and I think having this today to really look at silence as part of the service it's important and also just instrumental sound to really capture a part of our mind that isn't usually captured in church but I want to say the peace of the Lord be with you all let's take a moment and share with one another a sign of peace in preparation for the holy gospel this morning Before I get to the, the gospel this morning, I want to talk briefly about this practice of, of peace. Uh, and I want to provide, today's going to be a little bit of teaching slash, you know, we might get into where um, I would call it preaching, but it's more, uh, it's more desperation of men trying to de declare who God is and what he's doing. But the reality is God can be captured without any sound. If you're, if you're next to a waterfall or you're next to a, a, a striking image of the mountains or if you're just sitting with someone that you love, and you can sit there quietly without saying anything. God can be, God can be experienced in, in those ways, sometimes more powerful than in anything we have to say. But anyways, the peace of the Lord is important. So everybody put your hands together and realize that, um, that the early church valued senses from the top down. So it was sight, sound, smell, taste, and then touch. Touch was the least valued of, of the senses in the early church because touch is equivocated with sensuality and so they they were very mindful when believers were, were were going to have an experience where there was physical contact as to how that happened and so the hands together really are about us approaching someone else and sharing not our peace but the peace that comes from peace that comes from the table the peace that comes from God and so the way we do this, if you want to come over, Bob, and we can demonstrate this, we just walk up to someone and we'll say, the peace of the Lord be with you, and I will capture the peace from Bob. He captures it from me. We take it to our minds, and then we usually will make the sign of the cross in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because we lose our center. Things in life will throw us into chaos, and we lose our center, and we need someone else to help center us. So that we can remember where we're, where we're rooted and where we're grounded. Amen? Because there are, just like a ship on the ocean that's being tossed to and fro, the anchor holds us in position no matter where we are in reference to the anchor. Amen? Thank you, Bob. So the peace of the Lord is an important part of our practice. And the peace has to be removed from circumstance because if peace is linked to our circumstances, our peace will be taken quickly. But the one thing St. Nicholas, one of the great saints, he called us to guard was our peace. 
And he says, if you guard your peace well enough, you'll find a thousand new disciples. Because people know when other people are at peace. Amen. It's sitting with the son who had an accident yesterday who killed someone and trying to counsel them. Well, there's no words that can counsel that person. They're dysregulated because of a situation in their life. The best I can do is be a regulated person to help the dysregulated person begin to center and focus and come back into a place of awareness that's beyond the immediate circumstance that's challenging us. Amen? Amen. Well, the gospel, and I just felt like we should, and I want to teach on these things because if we don't understand what's happening, we start to duplicate what other people are doing, and we have no idea why. And that's where religion is born. Someone did something in the 1800s, and it's continued on, and now, now there's an entire movement called the Pentecostal movement. Well, the Pentecost was never meant to be a movement where we camped out. Pentecost is an experience that we pass through as we move on to tabernacles. Amen? As part of the church cycle. Not to, don't mean to offend any of you Pentecostals who are watching, but we can't camp out on one experience or one revelation because if we do, we cease to experience the entire experience of the cycle of the church which, is our, which, which portrays the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew, if you're prepared for the Gospel, go ahead and make a sign of the cross on your mind, which is where we need to have the most peace as we're hearing and declaring the Word of God. Jesus began to show His disciples that He must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised which is breaking news for the disciples who thought he was going to come in with a horse and a sword and just take over everything. He, they're hearing from their master that he has to die. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Now I can roll with Peter trying to walk on water, but Peter trying to counsel our Lord on how to be the Savior is where I draw the line. Amen? And we would say, well, I would never try that. Well, we, we, a lot of us are, have very difficult time not being in the driver's seat of life. Who knows that's true? We have, we have difficulty being in the following role as opposed to being in the leading role. I have a hard time being part of the supporting cast. I like to be the person in the spotlight. Amen? So Peter is saying, that's, that can't happen. And then Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not on the side of God, but of men. Then Jesus told his disciples, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself. Everybody say, deny himself. Deny myself. Take up my cross. And follow somebody else. For whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life? Or what shall a man give in return for his life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the, in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay every man for what he has done. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Happy are those who hear these words, who believe them, and who obey them. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. 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 Father, we beseech you this morning in the name, the nature, the character of your Son, by the power and person of your Holy Spirit. Lord, this morning's a morning where we turn down the volume and we turn up the, the inner experience of you, Lord. 
And as you're charging us this morning to contemplate the cross, Lord, help us to not do so just with our intellectual minds, but help us to realize that you're calling us to follow you. And we bless you now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. I admittedly am not a good test taker. Is anybody here a good test taker? Anybody here love taking tests? Raise your hand if you despise tests. You don't like them. Well, thanks for being honest there. We got two people. Uh, come on, there's a couple of other people. You just, you, you can't stand taking tests. I mean, yesterday I took a test. That, uh, it was something because we live in a virtual world now where the person proctoring my test, I think, lived in India or in Spain, I don't know, but it was online, and the test had the camera shining right on me, and the, the test recorded me for three and a half hours. It was my administrator's exam for, to be a school administrator, and I was recorded for three and a half hours answering 120 questions. Um, you know how fun that was. It was just, it was quite a joy. Uh, <laughs> a little bit of sarcasm there, but yeah, so I mean, I, here I am, I'm, I'm being filmed, everywhere I looked for three hours was being recorded, and I was, and I was thinking to myself, while well, everything I, I didn't know was being right on the screen uh, in terms of questions that I would get wrong and things that would happen, but tests produce anxiety, and there's a lot of smaller, that, that's a really big example of a test, but there's a lot of smaller tests in our lives that are, a lot, that are less on display that cause us to reflect on who we are and who we're not. There's smaller situations that, that oftentimes nobody's there, maybe one or two people are there, and our, our integrity is tested, and our identity is tested in those moments. Think about somebody who loans you a pen, you walk out of the bank, you're carrying the pen with you, do I return the pen? Do I take the pen with me? Am I stealing? Am I honest on my taxes? Do I, you know, well, Vlad laughed at that one, amen? So I think there, there's a couple of us that might have a situation where we want to just make things seem like there's something that they're not. And honesty and authenticity is difficult in that moment because we're torn between the person that we're called to be at the church and the person we know ourselves to be in the world. And those two people now are converging on each other. We have to make a decision as to who we're going to be in the moment. Amen? So many times in those little moments, it's the little moments that build trust, but it's the little moments that can destroy a relationship. It's a five-minute encounter with someone else that can destroy a marriage. It's a small little conversation you have with someone that can cause you to get fired. It's the small little foxes that spoil the vine. I know I'm speaking to God's first cousin here, so none of you are in any of these scenarios that I'm talking about. But this is where I live, where I have to make these decisions. And I think when I, I'm carrying around this wood because I want us to think about this idea of the cross. What is the cross? The cross is a game changer for those little moments. Who's ever heard of this idea of the master class some of you might even have a membership where they're teaching you how to be a better leader, how to be a better musician, how to be a better chef by watching a video of someone who's mastered that topic or idea. Anybody familiar with this concept or is it just me up here? You've heard of ma the master class where you can sit with a master and you can learn what they do. And I would say it's really challenging because watching a video has never, I mean, it's taught me some things intellectually, but in terms of how to practice something, you need to work with someone in the moment to become, what is it called, Bob? It's someone that's working with you, an apprentice. Apprenticeship means you're working alongside someone who's mastered this, and now you're trying to learn their skills and know what they know. Amen? Not, not many of us approach Christianity as it's an apprenticeship of learning a new lifestyle. We approach Christianity as being 
an, a set of philosophies that we may decide to agree with or we may decide to disagree with. Amen? But we don't approach it from a standpoint of, I'm now linked to a rabbi who's going to change the way I interact with every single person in the world. My life will never be the same as a result of my encounter with the cross. Amen? If Jesus were to offer a master class, what would his, what was his subject matter be? Levi, Bob, what, Troy, what would, what, would the, what would the topic of Jesus' master class be? And could you learn it in one or two hours watching a video on YouTube? Can you, can you learn it in one or two hours by attending a church service on a Sunday morning? Well, many Christians believe they're transforming to become just like Jesus because they attend a church on a Sunday morning. And that's where we've been duped as a culture because we approach the cross as being sometimes a part-time job rather than a full-time responsibility to represent our Lord in every situation. Amen? Oh, man. Church attendance is part of the process of becoming like the master. I'm not saying this, it's, that's not the case, but it certainly isn't the end-all, be-all. We aren't transforming. My, my car is in my garage, but my car will never become a garage. Transformation takes a lot of little choices along the way that will lead us to be someone 10 years from now that we aren't today. It's a lot of consistent choices that seem very small. It's the principle, you know, it's the principle of just a few. You do two push-ups today, you're going to be sore tomorrow. You do two push-ups every day for a year, you're going to lose 15 pounds and be a different person in a year. It's the, it's the principle of percentages. Amen? And this morning, the Lord's giving a recipe of how to transform. And it's not going to happen in like a microwave. It's a crock pot. We've got to think more along the lines of this is going to take hours and years. It's not going to happen over one, just over 30 seconds. We want the hot pocket in one minute. And God's saying, I'm going to transform you, but you've got to hang out with folk who are going to challenge you and be consistent over time. And in time, you will not be the same. I don't know who knew me 20 years ago. There's a few people around here that man knew me 20 years ago, but am I a little bit different than I was 20 years ago? I'm not the same person. I can stand on the stage and not have a panic attack. Amen? That's the first thing. <laughs> Thank you for those hand claps. I mean, I used to be the most afraid person on the stage holding the candle. I'm like, I can't hold anything because I can't breathe up here with all these lights and everybody's looking at me. We online? You transform over time. But you got to hang in there and stick with the process and not give up and hit the ejection button of your process. Jesus is telling his disciples, I'm not here, boys, for self-improvement. I'm not here to help you with your personal glory. I'm not here to help you be any better at who you are. I'm here to help you do one thing, and that's to become like me, and that's going to require a death of who you are. Amen? I feel like a farmer up here with the, with the, I mean, it's just like, I feel like Moses. I hope I don't tear the carpet. He goes from following Jesus, this is Peter's, this is Peter's dilemma, and many of us, I relate so much to Peter, and I went to a little Orthodox church over here, uh, 43rd and Xavier, and someone, they mistook my name for two months because they, th they didn't know I was Father Anthony, they called me Father Peter for two months. And I thought to myself, man, I must need to really relate to Peter. And when I read him in Scripture, I'm like, this is one person I can, I can really relate to. Because Peter goes from being a follower and a disciple to being a, to being a mentor and a, and a counselor to Jesus in a moment. Because Peter disagreed with what Jesus was saying and didn't think death was necessary for him. Imagine pulling, imagine pulling Jesus aside and giving him directions on how to be the Messiah. Well, a lot of us are like, well, I would never make that choice, would we, Rhonda? You and I, we would never just try and tell Jesus how to be the Messiah. Well, here's the reality. We try and tell a lot of other people around us what to do all the time. I mean, I don't know 
if it's Severus, if it's Diana, if it's Bob, if it's, you know, my friends over here, we try and tell other people what to do all the time, and we want them just to, just to snap into shape and do it. Anybody know anybody that tells other people what to do? No, there's none of us. Maybe Severus and Father Phil are honest. But if you're in a marriage relationship, you know this all too well. Oh, come on, somebody. I didn't get any amens from the husbands. Uh, I've, I've just, I've just, I'm like Forrest Gump sometimes. I'm like, to, tell, to do whatever you tell me to, drill sergeant. <laughs> I'm at peace when my wife gives me directions. Even if I knew what was supposed to happen, like when she points and goes, here's your exit. Okay, baby, we going that way. I knew that's the way we were supposed to go, but I'm not going to get into a fight for four days over it. Come on, somebody. I'm, I'm talking where we live. If you're not married, you, you know, you, maybe you're telling your coworkers what to do. Maybe you're telling your siblings what to do. Maybe you're telling yourself what to do because you think you know what's best for yourself, which is the most dangerous place that any of us can be, to think we can guide the path and put, bring ourselves to the outcome we desire. And I would say, how's that working for any of us? If I would have told my 25, myself 25 years ago, you're going to be an assistant principal and be a vocational pastor and all these things, I wouldn't have believed myself back then. But God always takes us down a path that we wouldn't believe for ourselves. So we're going to talk about the three, the three ingredients this morning, and I'm going to ask for some audience participation. Everybody say amen to that. Because how many of you know that sermons can sometimes be two-way communication? People get frustrated when we talk at you all the time. Anybody get frustrated by that? Don't, you don't have to raise your hand, Michelle. I see you over there. Amen? <laughs> the first step is to deny yourself. Or if we're going to make it even a little bit more personal, to deny myself. And, we, and this, is, this is what we're talking about, man. Have you, seen, have you seen the cross? You have? You never seen it? Who's got a cross necklace? Let me look for the necklaces here. Come on, you got fish, fish on your car, something smelling fishy. You know what I mean? Let me, let me see here if we got crosses. Oh, there we go. There we go. How many got coworkers that have crosses lying like the devil is? Oh, ain't nobody here. I mean, we got a cross, but we, if, they, if, they, if they deliver our, our order at McDonald's five minutes late, we're ready to throw the ketchup at the wall. Crosses mean nothing in this culture. Hey, come on, work with me here. Crosses mean nothing in this. People buy crosses because they think it's going to get them a, a better interest rate. I mean, and wear it around the necklace. But can I have you, do you, do you mind volunteering up here? But crosses in relationships mean something. Let's give it up for our young people here. Let's thank God for them. I want you guys to stand facing each other. Just stand facing each other. Back up a little bit, brother. Come on now. Work with me here. Jesus. I should have had Avery and Caleb up here for this one. How many of you know the cross will, will mean that he interacts with her differently because he knows the cross, and she'll interact with him differently because they're working through the cross? This right here represents patience, restraint, hope, peace, calm tones. Amen? If our young people are working through the cross, they realize there's going to be some self-restraint in the relationship. How many of you know that's true? The cross changes things. Let me take this cross away. And they're having a whole different experience as a young couple. Amen? Wait, are you guys a couple? Okay, that's cool. Amen. Thank God for that. Are we about to start something new here? You guys can be seated. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> The cross changes things. It changes how I interact with my boss at work. It changes how I talk to somebody when I'm talking on the customer service line. Work with me here. And they, and they can't hardly talk to me. Our frustration level changes when, we have, when we're working through the cross. Who agrees with me? It changes the way we perceive situations. Because if, uh, okay, so let's talk about denying ourselves. So, who wants to give me an example of what self denial means? How do you, what's an example of how you've denied yourself recently? 
I don't want to call on everybody at once here. <laughs> what do you think? Deborah. I didn't hear you. When you want to smoke, you deny yourself. So you deny cravings. Well, I think you just spoke about everybody in this room. Amen. Everybody say amen to that. Who's had a craving this week? One or two. It, I, and I, I can say two words is going to help you put this right into context. Krispy Kreme. I mean, just raise your hand right here. <laughs> cravings. A big one, Deborah. Right? Saying no to what you want to in the moment because you know in the moment that's not good for you. Right? Who else? Man, this is like a true pop quiz. I, see, I, I asked you if you didn't want to be tested, and here we are. Troy. Showing patience. And I'm not going to make Troy give an example because I want to keep Troy straight up here with everybody. Amen? <laughs> Showing patience. Think about a situation where we, you've been impatient. I'm going to think about one when I've been impatient. When the person you're talking to should already understand what you're saying. Amen? They, they, should, they should know where you're coming from. They have no idea. You've been in a relationship for several years and they still don't know who you really are. They're still living in the box you put them in five years ago. Amen? Patience. We're going to move on because I can see that was so popular. Amen. It was just, I mean, there's hands going up. Take up your cross. Restoration is a messy, messy business. Restoration is messy. So what does it, what does it mean for us to take up our cross? Now, most of us think we can never eat food again. We've got, we got to be living in a fasted state. That's not what it means. What it means is God's called us to be somebody, and he, he was an architect to build us to be somebody. And everybody along, along our path in life has put different colors of paint on us and tried to redecorate us and try to make us look a certain way. But we got to get back to who God originally made us to be and uncover that person and figure out what that person is and start living from that as being our reference point. It's okay to clap. We're past the pop quiz. Amen? we got to live with that as our reference point. Otherwise, we wake up and we keep recreating the mess of who we th the world thinks we should be. But finding an authentic place means that we are taking up our cross. Cross means contradiction. Look at your neighbor and say contradiction. Contradiction means we step out of an either-or type of viewpoint. You guys know either or. You're either good or evil, black or white, pretty ugly, smart, stupid, technically capable or technically not. And the world labels us with all of these things, and that's called dualism. Everybody say that with me, dualism. This is fast food religion. It's fast food religion. It's the, diff the difference between the lizard brain and the wizard brain. And I, I use this a lot with young people, and I think when we talk about the cross, we oftentimes, and how many, of you, how many of you know that she's not anxious at all about crying and disrupting, amen? She's at complete and total peace, and let's thank God for that, and we should be more like that. If a baby can disrupt a church service, Jesus wasn't there, amen? Because he loved children. He said, come unto me. T taking up our cross is about intentionally bridging the gap in our mind and being willing to say the words, the most difficult words, which is both and. Look at your neighbor and say both and. So many people see the table in the Eucharist as being opposed to evangelical Christianity. Here's the cross. I'm just going to believe in. I'm just going to believe in God, and I'm going to be saved and go to heaven. And then they believe that something like this where there's actual icons and there's chalices is, is a challenge to that belief system. But the reality is, everybody say both and. We don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We can have both. 
In fact, if we come up to receive communion and I'm carrying my cross and I don't have faith, how many of you know that's still bread and wine? There's a part of the Eucharist that requires our faith. Amen? We can't come up faithless. There's a bit of a, it's a, it's a, it's a mystery that requires our buy-in and our belief. So taking up our cross requires both and. And finally, the Lord gives his disciples the most difficult counsel, which is follow me. Everybody say, follow me. What do you guys think, what do you guys think that means to you? You know, what do you think it means? Follow me. Transform to be Christ-like. How many of you agree with being on that answer? Follow me. Bob, what do you think it means? Follow him. Bob? Take up your cross and follow me. Severus, if you want to, we can do a little illustration here. Come on up, Severus, and let's just go through. And Severus is going to examine my path. And if you know the story of Moses, Moses was following, or Moses was leading, and they were going the wrong way for 40 years. Everybody say amen. I mean, I can follow somebody maybe, maybe one mile, and they're going the wrong way. But I, for 40 years, I mean, that's something else. I mean, you're going along, and here you're going the wrong way, and the person behind you maybe wants to lean up and say, can we take it right here? How many of you have ever looked at your leader and questioned the direction they're going and had the choice between still following, even though you thought it was wrong, or jumping off the ship and going in a different direction? Amen. How many of you have ever, ever been in a marriage where you see your spouse going the wrong direction and you want to you just reach up and say, can we take a left here? But you still have to keep following or you're going to jump, jump the ship and get a divorce. And I'm not saying that's not ever an option. But somebody take that, people take that card all the time. So Severus is going to follow me and we became a Eucharistic church. And guess how many members we had before that? How many? A thousand? Guess how many we had after we became Eucharistic? We're, we're trying to get 12 here today. You know? I'm just kidding. But the reality is people see and judge decisions of the leader, and they make other choices based on how they think the leader is doing. How many people quit a job just because of their boss? Come on, work with me here. I didn't say if you've ever done that. I'm just saying how many of you know that's the case, that some people quit jobs just because they don't like their boss? How many, how many kids do you think want to change classes just because they don't like their teacher? We have, we have a culture where leaders are disposable based on the perception of the follower. Amen? And the reality is our leaders are imperfect. When a kid comes to me and says, I don't like my teacher, I want to change to a new teacher, I say, what, what, what do you not like about your teacher? Well, she's mean. Well, she's the best teacher you ever had because you're about to get better at being you. Amen? Come on. See, notice that through this whole sermon, Severus has been following me. How am I doing, Severus? He said, great. Take a left here, he said. See, in the West, in our culture, the followers have incredible power. Incredible power. Man, I sit with people from other cultures. How many of you ever sat with somebody uh, from the Muslim faith or from the Buddhist faith and they sit with their mentors and they don't make eye contact because they respect their mentors so much? They literally revere their elders. And man, here we are trying to figure out if our theology for our leader is right. Thank you, Severus. How many years we've been doing this? Severus has been following. How many years? 20 years. Let's give it up for Severus. Because we ind individualize our faith. Stand to your feet with me this morning. I know this has been a little bit different kind of message. 
Some people like being preached at because to be called on is a whole lot, a little bit harder. Amen. <laughs> We don't, want, we, we don't want to go to AMC and have the movie interact with us. That's a whole other deal. Amen? But I want you to examine and think about the relationships in your life and how, if, we were to get, if you were to give yourself a grade in terms of how you're following, what grade would you give yourself? And people get frustrated with us sometimes because we do follow so well. Amen? But if you high-five your neighbor and say, it's okay to follow, it's okay to not know everything, and it's okay to not be perfect. Father, we thank you this morning for your cross. I thank you for every single person here. Most of all, we thank you for our online family, Lord. And we thank you that the cross changes things in our life. And that we never go wrong preaching the cross. Help us, Lord, to take up our cross daily, to think about our choices. Deny ourselves and follow you. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And together we say, Amen. Let us profess our faith in Almighty God. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty.